All right. How are you? Good? We, we are winding down. We've got, we've got this week and next week. And in, in fact, this, this week is the, the actual end to the thread series. And, and next week is kind of like a, an add-on. It's a, it's a bonus. but uh, Supplemental we, material. We will... Uh, we are reaching the, the climactic ending to the threads tonight. So I hope you're ready. But you can't skip next week. Just because we said it's supplemental, you still got to come, okay? We're, we're yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. watching, right? <laughs> if you bail on the last week, so. Well, if you show up, you get 100. All you got to do is show up next week, and you get 100 on the Just final. Show up. So. Just show but up. if you don't, you fail. So. All right, did, did everyone get a copy of this week's material? Oh, yeah. Yes, no? Yes. You can put your hand up if not. Good? All right. Everybody um, knows the routine now. Okay, this evening we're going to talk about rest, the, a theology of rest woven through uh, the scripture. And um, it's... It's best tonight to begin with uh, the application in mind. Uh, the reason that this topic is so important um, and the, the application for it is some straightforward questions like, are we supposed to keep the Sabbath day as, as Christians, as believers uh, throughout my life being introduced to, to Baptist uh, world and kind of, uh, I don't know, diff- different ages of churches. I, apparently, they're, they're, before my time, there were things called blue light laws, okay, where, uh, uh, where everything was closed on Sunday. And, th- and that was because we were keeping the Sabbath, Although I would press you a little bit and I would tell you, uh, you're not really keeping the Sabbath because the Sabbath is on Saturday. You, you can't keep the Sabbath on Sunday because the day of the week is specifically called the Sabbath. It's you can't Saturday. just move it if you want to. You can't just move it if you want to. So anyways, there are real practical applications. Should we keep the Sabbath, what is it? should we keep the festivals? We've talked a little bit about that. And, and how do we apply that? Well, this is going to become important. Uh, and, and we're going to walk through a theology of rest. If, if you understand this thread, you will understand the movement of Scripture. And then you'll be able to answer some of those questions yourself. We'll circle back around at the yeah. end. And we will make direct application. But wanted to start with the application because those are some important questions. Has, has anyone here ever struggled with, should we be keeping the Sabbath day? Yeah, yeah, of course we have. And then well, how do you answer that? And how is it moved? And why, why are we doing, yeah, really important stuff. Okay. My parents used to make us sit on the couch on Sundays after church, and we couldn't go out and ride our bikes or play with our friends because we were keeping the Sabbath. Yeah, so, there you go. You're honoring the Lord. Sit on the couch. It didn't feel like honoring the Lord. It didn't feel it like didn't it. It didn't feel like it. But those, those, are, uh, th- those are real world practical implications of, of working out, right? Uh, and and uh, there we go. There we go. All right, with that said, uh, Daniel, let's pray, and then we'll, I'll jump into it. All right, Father, we just pause right now. We thank you uh, for this time we've had this semester. Uh, Father, my prayer is that this time has been a chance for us just to fall more in love with your word, to be more in awe of you as the author of this book, as it has taught us about you and your plan, uh, and God, how it is so intentional, how it's so detailed, and all of it points to the ability for us to know you uh, and to be able to experience your love and fellowship with you. So God, as we continue uh, this evening uh, to 
dig into your word. God, would you teach us uh, by your Holy Spirit uh, and reveal the truth to us in your word uh, and help us to apply it to our everyday lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, like most weeks, there's a ton of content here. And that's why you have it all printed out for you, all highlighted, so that I can keep your attention up here. You can go back and you can watch the video, and then you can go home and you can study the scripture, but I need you to be able to stick with me as we follow the thread, okay? Um, So let's start in the beginning. In the beginning, God takes what is formless and void and begins to work and to make it. And uh, the fun thing about scripture, he speaks everything into being, but he also is is like an artist. And if you pay attention to the works that he does is he's he's moving things and placing them. He's an artist on a canvas, okay? And so what we know at the, at, at the, the beginning and at the end of creation, is that God created everything and it was good, okay? So there was this creation and then God rested, okay? Then God rested from his work. And you get this exhale. But then what happens in Genesis chapter three? The fall. And at the fall, as you pay attention to what's happening in Genesis 3, there are two major things that occurs. One, we find that uh, man is cursed and man enters unrest and that cursing or uh, uh, covers the entirety of creation. So this creation that was at this peaceful state of rest has now entered into unrest and man is cursed, right? Curse is the ground because of you, and in toil, okay, uh, you will have to work and eat all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, thistles shall grow for you, okay? By the sweat of your brow, you will, you will toil, okay? So man is cursed, and man enters unrest, but something else that you probably haven't paid attention to is that God resumes work. God, who is in a state of rest, okay, because he had created everything good and perfect, the the seventh day in Genesis, as you walk through, it never ends, okay? This has long been picked up by theologians. The seventh day never ends. The six days all have morning and evening, but the seventh day, it never ends. Why? Because God has stayed in his state of rest, But as you come through Genesis 3, you'll find out God begins to resume work. God becomes the actor. God is the one who will put enmity between the seed, uh, the serpent and the woman. God is the one who greatly multiplies uh, pain in childbirth. And then God is the one who makes garments for Adam and Eve. And God is the one who sends them out of the garden. So God is the actor. God has suddenly entered in and began to separate, to again draw lines and establish what we can and cannot do. God has moved into a completely rework. Okay, he's picked that mantle back up. Now, before we go any further, just in case you think I'm missing the boat on this, I want to call your attention to John chapter 5, because there was an ongoing deep theological debate that had existed all through Jewish history. Because the the Jews had become so strict with their Sabbath law, theologians, as they like to do, they sit around and they ask themselves difficult questions. And one of those questions was, do you think God takes the Sabbath day off? And they pondered and they thought, and then they said, well, well, how is it that the sun still rises or that he holds the universe into place? And, and they would give various answers. This was one that just blew everyone's mind. There's no way to answer this and various opinions. And they would argue and they would wrestle over this. It is to that that Jesus, listen to what Jesus says in John 15, 16 and 17. So Jesus had just healed a man at the pool of Bethesda and he had done it on the Sabbath day. Okay, and so they were, they were mad at him. They were persecuting Jesus because of this. In verse 17, Jesus answered them and says, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Now, because it was on a Sabbath day, Jesus was answering that question. My father is working. Why? Because of this. 
okay? There was this fall from rest, and so God is working out redemption. Now, here's why that matters. You'll, you'll see as this thread continues. So let's, let's move on and let's continue to work through the idea. At the beginning is creation and rest, but then there's a fall from it. Then we're quickly introduced to Noah. Um, we've gone through him before, but as you see with Noah, there's this promise that's given at the very beginning. He is, this one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands. And you think that that's going to be so refreshing. Is this going to be uh, the one who redeems? Is this the seed of the woman who's going to redeem this unrest that we've encountered? But as you can see in, in Genesis 9, 20 through 25, Noah got drunk and all sorts of bad things happened. And you realize, oh, he fell the same way that Adam did. So he's not the one that is going to bring rest. And then we're going to fast forward to when Israel is in Egypt. And now I want you to see the movement of the Exodus. We've covered the Exodus as a whole uh, typology and thread, the importance of the Exodus. But now I want to comb quickly through the Exodus account, and I want you to see it through the lens of rest. Okay, there's unrest and rest. So you might not have picked up on this, but remember, when Israel was in Egypt, they were subject to hard labor, right? You probably knew that. Pharaoh gives them hard labor. And in Exodus 5, uh, verse 5, Pharaoh specifically says, because Moses has said, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, like, look, well, you, you want me to let them rest from their labors? Now, why do I tell you that? Because this pattern, this idea of being in Egypt where there is hard labor, the Exodus is a picture of coming out to find rest, okay? That's what I'm going to build for you. Daniel, no that the Exodus is coming out to rest. And so as Israel comes out, while they are making the covenant at Mount Sinai is now the first introduction in the whole of Scripture for the command to keep the Sabbath day, okay? And so the first thing that happens here is we have institutional institutional rest, because God has called out his people, okay? He is, he is calling them and giving them, and he begins to set up institutional rest, okay? And you see a couple of uh, passages there. You can see three passages there. That, so God is going to call them out, and Daniel's going to cover here in a second how they're going to enter this land, and this land is going to be their rest. Okay, But the first thing is that God wants them to begin to establish, because they are his people, that God is giving rest to his people. And, and they had to have it in an organized form and fashion as God's people, they are reinstituting the rest from the very beginning of creation. And so you see those passages in the Ten Commandments where you are given the Sabbath day, the seventh day, because God rested on that seventh day. You, as my people, are now to rest. Do not do any work on that day. And then the other thing you'll see in that Deuteronomy passage is you're supposed to tie it to, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt, and I brought you out of Egypt because I'm the one that's going to give you rest, okay? So observe my rest. So you can see there, there's lots of passages on this. I have them listed there for you. Uh, additionally, as part of this institutional rest, these commandments of rest, whenever they enter the land, they are also supposed to give the land itself rest. There's supposed to be a regular rhythm of rest that is incorporated in even how they live in the land. So let's talk about the land then for a minute, right? Because we've been teasing the fact that, that we are to view these 
in this institutional rest, God gave them these weekly reminders of where their rest was, right? It is in the Lord. And so every week they were to pause and, and remember. Uh, but then the land, as they were wandering in the wilderness, as they were looking forward to the promised land where the Lord was taking them, they were to see that this land that they would enter would be this place of rest. And there's multiple scriptures here. The one in Leviticus, he says, listen, it's going to be a place of blessing. It'll be a place you can lie down and no one's going to make you tremble. You will be able to rest and have peace there. In Deuteronomy, he talks about it again. Look at the language in verse nine. He says, it will be this land, right? You're not there yet, but when you get there, it will be this resting place for you. He even gives them details. When you cross the Jordan and you live in the land, he will give you rest there. Verse 11, it will be a place in which the Lord your God will choose for his name to dwell. So there we're cluing in a little bit more. What is this rest in the land? Why is this land going to be a place of rest? Because it is a place where his name is attached, the name of Yahweh. So we're seeing a connection there, aren't we? The Lord and rest, right? He is in the land. They will have rest in the land when he takes them in. And it will be this place where they will be able to worship him. So there's another attachment to it. He says, with burnt offerings and sacrifices and tithes, but it all points to this fact that they have come out of slavery, this place of unrest, and they are entering a land that they are to view as the place where God is going to provide for them to rest. And so they're looking forward to this. And then in uh, Deuteronomy 25, right before they're to enter the promised land, he reminds them again that God has given you rest from your enemies in the land. Well, then we pick it up in Joshua where they are conquering the land, where, where God takes them into the land. And in Joshua 1, the Lord speaks to Joshua and he says, look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be with you. You are going to conquer the enemies in the land and you are going to drive them out. And I am going to give you rest when I give you this land. And then that, the book ends of the book, God promises it in Joshua 1, but then the close of Joshua it is promise fulfilled. Look at this. In verse 44 of 21, the Lord gave them rest on every side, right? Goes all the way back to the Leviticus passage where he says, you're going to lie down and not tremble. He's given them rest on every side. Joshua 22, and the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers, Joshua 23, and it came about that after many days, the Lord had given rest to Israel, why? Because they're now in the land and God has defeated their enemies on every side and they finally have rest. And so as you're reading this, you're meant to kind of lean in with anticipation to say, is this finally it, right? Adam and Eve in the garden were kicked out of the place of rest, right? They went to a place of hard labor, right? There's not been rest, but finally they're in the land. Their enemies are subdued. This will be the place of rest. And it would be wonderful if scripture ended right there, but we have to go on to the book of Judges. And then we see the disaster, right? The rest does not last. We see in Judges chapter two, right after Joshua dies, the first thing Israel does is they are unfaithful to the Lord and they start to serve the Baals and foreign gods. And it says they forsook the Lord. And by the end of Judges, we have cycle after cycle where their enemies come back in. So now there's no rest, right? Because part of their rest is the absence of their their enemies, they're not afraid, they have peace, but now they forsook, they forsook the Lord, so now they have enemies again. So God has to send deliverers time after time after time to deliver them from their enemies. There's a period of peace, a little bit of rest, but then another cycle of rebellion and judgment occurs. Each time the period of rest gets shorter and the, the, the consequences of the sin get more extreme till we finally get to the end of the book of Judges where the, the writer tells us that Israel had no king in those days. Who was their king supposed to be? Yahweh. And it says they had no king in those days. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And we're meant to understand the connection. Doing what is right in your own eyes, right? Having no king, God not being your king, means there is going to be unrest. The land was not the source of the rest. It was God. Right, But the land was supposed to be this picture of his faithfulness and his promises that he has kept for them. 
But now Israel is in again, once again, in this state of unrest as we come to the end of the book of Judges. They have no king, right? They have enemies in the land and there's no rest. Okay, so just to recap, right? We started in Eden and man fell out of the restful state. And now we've, we've come out of Egypt into this land of rest. We, we, we have institutional rest that's been commanded. Okay, we've entered this place of rest. And as Daniel just said, everything fell apart when they got in the land, even though at the end of jo- uh, Joshua it said, oh, we had rest. Oh, maybe the problem is we need a king, right? We need a king. Yeah, there's no king. There's no king. We need a king like all the other nations. So, quickly fast forward and we enter into King David comes. And David comes as the great rescuer. So we have Saul who continually warred with his enemies, but David comes as the great rescuer. And when David comes, he actually is going to accomplish again the rest Okay, that was lost after they entered the land, right? You had that brief period. Oh, we got rest, okay? And and David comes in and the promise, the great promise that comes to David in 2 Samuel chapter seven actually comes after this statement, right? That the Lord had given David rest. You're supposed to hear that and you're like, yes, finally rest has been restored. So David comes along as the great hero, And with David as the hero, the one who accomplishes this great rest, then there is this promise and this implementation of the temple that God is going to have a permanent dwelling place. So now look at the picture of rest. We we have the land of rest. We have the institutional rest. commanded rest that's supposed to happen and function, and now we're about to get the permanent dwelling place, the spot of God. But David is not allowed to build the temple. Does anyone know why? Because he had been a man of too much war. Think about that in rest categories. He was the one who had to fight off everyone, okay? The reason he had to fight everyone off was because the people were sinful and and the enemies kept coming in. But he, he had to fight them all off, but he had too much bloodshed. And so the promise, the blessing of David is passed down to his son, Solomon. And Solomon becomes known as a man of rest. Look at, look at 1 Chronicles 22 verse 9. Okay. Behold, a son will be born to you who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all of his enemies, and he's going to build for me a house, okay? Um, and, and, then it, and then it continues that Solomon builds the temple, and look at those passages, because as he builds that temple, you get this repeated refrain of, now there's rest, God has given us rest and God has fulfilled all of the promises that he had told to Moses, okay? Look at that at the end of 1 Kings 8, 56, okay? So blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, okay? And and not one, one word has failed from all of his good promises which he promised through Moses, his servant. And in fact, I can show you multiple places here where God's temple now becomes the resting place. That's what it's called, the resting place. God has found his resting place because David, the hero, has come and defeated all the enemies and he has passed down the blessing to his son and there is peace from all of the other enemies. We have institutional rest and now the temple is there and the temple is known as God's resting place. So the Davidic king rests from enemies in the land, God's temple. The promise of Moses has been fulfilled. And then you ask the question, have we arrived Have we now, through David and his son Solomon, have we accomplished 
okay? Have we returned back to the rest of Eden? And the story ended and they lived happily ever after, right? No, not at all. You, you know more of the story, right? It, we don't even get through Solomon's reign before we see like the, the fractures in the kingdom. And you know what's coming, right? All these little clues in Solomon's life tell you disaster is on the horizon. And so we don't get past Solomon's own sons before the kingdom is divided and rest is gone, right? And it's this picture. You've seen it since the very beginning, right? With Adam, rest and then sin, no rest, no Noah, right? Starting over with Noah and his family, rest, no rest. Then Joshua, rest, no rest. Judges, no rest, no rest, no rest, no rest. Finally to David and Solomon. David conquers the enemies. Solomon builds the temple. And after just a brief moment, the rest has been, is gone again, but it doesn't stop there. Look on at what happens. It gets to the point. Look at what Isaiah the prophet says, right? It's, it's this, this picture here. He says that even Israel, but here's what they're doing, right? Even though we're to understand in reading this, they have forsaken the Lord, right? They are worshiping other gods. Their hearts are divided, right? They're trying to serve two masters at the same time. They are not in a state of rest, but they try to convince themselves that they are because they continue to try to practice the institutional rest. They still celebrate the feasts and the festivals. They're still trying to keep the Sabbath. But look at what Isaiah says to them on their way to exile. He is prophesying that there will be a time of exile, right? Because you are not resting in the Lord. And he says, listen, all of these things you're doing that are this fake, this false rest, it, you're fooling yourselves into believing that you have rest because the Lord says, listen, I hate your festivals. I hate the way you're pretending to have rest because your rest is supposed to be found in me, which is exactly what he's saying in verse 16 of Isaiah 1. He goes, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil, cease to do evil. Right, that, that is where they will find rest, but they think it's in these rituals, right? In these religious practices. And so in Hosea, in his prophecy, right? We looked at Hosea last week when we talked about this, this thread of marriage, but there's more in there than just the thread of marriage. Hosea says, listen, I'm gonna put an end. The Lord says, I'm gonna put an end to all of your celebrations and your gaiety and your feasts and your moon moons and your Sabbaths or your rests. He says, I'm gonna to put an end to those. Why would God do that? Because he's kind and because he's loving and he wants to remove from them this false sense of rest that they, that they have to show them their true need for rest that is only found in him. And so Isaiah, all through his prophecy, is pointing them to exile is coming. Why? Because they are going to be kicked out of the land of rest. They're no longer going to be there, right? And it's why, because they've rejected the Lord. That's what Jeremiah tells us, flip the page. And look at what Jeremiah says. The Lord says, listen, right? In me, you would find rest for your souls, but what was their response? I don't want it, right? We're, we're not gonna walk in that in verse 16. Exile had to come because Israel was unfaithful in the land of rest. And so, just like in Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord and literally the land of Eden, God had to kick them out of the land, right? Israel's unfaithfulness and there has gotten to this point, right? Living in this land of rest where they are not being faithful to the Lord. They don't truly have rest. The land literally vomits them out, right? And they go to Assyria and Babylon, right? And, and they are sent into exile. Why? Because they're not, they're not trusting in the Lord. They're not finding their rest in him. They are searching for fulfillment in things in everyone else. They've rebelled against the rest that's found in the Lord. And so exile is the only solution. Remember, we tied that in with in marriage last week with this idea of divorce, right? God is saying to them, I am divorcing you, right? I am, I am kicking you out of the land because you have not been faithful to me. 
to find rest in me in the land. And so then, keep going with me here, is the land the real source of rest? I mean, there's not, in the Old Testament, right? They've, they've got the institutional rest. God says, I hate that, right? He's put them in this land that's supposed to be rest. They've been unfaithful, and now they're no longer in the land, right? So now they're in exile, so they have no king, right? They have no land. They're kicked out of their land, and their temple has been destroyed. I mean, when we get to Ezekiel, not only is their temple going to be destroyed, does Nebuchadnezzar come in and take all the things and burn everything, but it gets even worse than that in Ezekiel. Yeah, because God's presence leaves the temple. I mean, the, the reason the temple matters is because God's presence is there. So all the reasons that you would, that, that are tied to, I'm giving you the promised land of rest, right, is, is God's presence is there. I will give you this and, and, and restore you from your enemies, um, and, and you will practice all of my institutional rest. All of this has fallen apart. All of it has failed. And they have been, uh, I love that, that term, right? The land has vomited them out, okay? This is the same way here, right? Adam and Eve get kicked out of Eden. They are exiled. So they get vomited out. Do, do you think if they just get vomited out for 70 years and then, and then come back that that's going to fix everything? Has it fixed everything yet? I mean, we've seen a pattern, right? I mean, there's a pattern forming. <laughs> so, so when Isaiah talks about the new exodus that's coming, right? A new one of these. A new exodus out of the chains and depravity in, back into the land of rest. And, and now that Israel is exiled over here to Babylon... Is it going to be any different if they just come back 70 years later back? Are, are they finally going to start the institutional rest, keeping the Sabbaths and the festivals? Are they going to start doing that better and that's going to be enough? God's presence never goes back to the temple. Like, what do we need? Right, and that's how the Old Testament... We need a whole new covenant, don't we? Yeah. Right? Don't we need a new exodus and a new rest that's found in none other than Jesus? Jesus. Right, because the Old Testament leaves us with this very sobering reminder. Rest was not in an institution. Rest was not in a land. Rest was not in a building, right? Rest is only going to be found in a person, the person of Jesus Christ in this new covenant. And so when we enter into the gospels, even before we get there, Isaiah's prophecy, I want you to see this. Look at what Isaiah says about the one who will come, the Messiah, this root of Jesse. What does it say? His resting place will be glorious. And then in the gospels, when the word becomes flesh and tabernacles among us, the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, what does he say? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and what? I will give you, I will give you rest, right? Person. You will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you because it is easy and my burden is light. Jesus points to himself, does he not? And says, I am the place of rest, right? But if we, we, can, we, can, we can say, well, you're just kind of, you're, you're, you're stretching it here, right? This, you know, maybe that's not what he's talking about is this, this thread of rest that we've seen all through the Old Testament. But he is because Matthew chapter 12 continues the narrative. Just because there's a chapter break doesn't mean that there's been a break in what is going on here. In Matthew 12, there is Jesus and his disciples. They, his disciples have been eating grain, and it is what day of the week? Uh-oh, big no-no, right? The Pharisees see it. They don't like it. They call Jesus out on it. They go, why are your disciples working on the day of rest? And so Jesus lets them have it, right? And he said, but then he gets to this point where he says, listen, you know, with David, there was this exception where they ate bread, right? The show bread in the tabernacle. And then, and then you've got the priest who eat, you know, on the Sabbath, right? And, you know, you don't make a big deal about that, but you're making a big deal about these guys. Listen, he says something even greater than the temple is here now. And the son of man is the Lord of rest. 
the Lord of rest, right? Jesus and the Father. And this is the beautiful picture of the gospel, right? When the word becomes flesh and dwells among us, when God sends Christ into this world, right? In the fullness of time, Galatians 4, 4, Jesus enters the world. We're meant to see, right? Just like God had to pick up his work again after the fall, we see Jesus working again. Why is he working? To establish rest. Once again, John chapter five, we were just there, right? We're, the, we're at the pool of Bethesda where they're mad about Jesus healing someone on a Sabbath day. He answered them, my father is working until now. I am working till now. I'm working on the Sabbath, right? What you think is, is where rest is found. I'm working to provide real rest. All right. Do you get this flow? We can hammer it one more time. Eden, (laughs) rest, God rested, fall from rest, kicked out of the land. Exodus typology, out of hard labor, back into rest, into that land of rest, but they never ever are able to establish it. None of it, they, 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 it falls apart, okay? Now with that, the spot in the New Testament to understand rest is Hebrews chapter three and chapter four. You have those sections printed out for you, okay? In in trying to decide how how to present this to you, I wanted you to see the thread first so now when we read this section, you will be able to understand what he is saying. And you will be able to check me and say, are you doing that right? Is that really what's taking place? Because this this is how it works. So I wanna show you briefly from this text how it's taking place. All right, so in Hebrews chapter three, beginning in verse seven, he quotes Psalm 95, okay? And he's, he's talking about faith. He's talking about uh, uh, walking with the Lord. And then he quotes Psalm 95. And there are two words highlighted there. And I'll come back to this in a second. This today, okay? And then they shall not enter my rest. Now, who wrote Psalm 95? David. David, all right? That's gonna become important. Now, look at verse 18, whenever it says, And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter, pause, enter what? Enter what? Well, the land, okay? Psalm 95 here is looking back to the land, okay? What what we're talking about is the unfaithful generation in the wilderness. They came out of Egypt, but they didn't enter the land. And God said, you will not enter my rest because you've been unfaithful in 40 years until that generation died off, okay? That's, that's what he's talking about. So Psalm 95 is looking back to this and this picture, this type, this pattern of you will not enter God's, you will not enter the land because the land is the place of rest. Okay, now, uh, chapter four, verse one, again, no chapter break, it's the very next sentence. Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, what's that talking about? When he says entering his rest there, what is he talking about? Huh? Entering the land? No. Look at verse three. For we who have believed enter that rest. Okay. So there, what he's talking about is we're talking about belief. Okay. We're talking about salvation, which is a spiritual event. Okay, why am I showing you this? 
because the author of Hebrews is using this that I've drawn as a type, a pattern, a picture of entering into real rest. And what is that real rest? It's salvation in Jesus Christ. That's where rest is found, okay? And, and just like those who came out of Egypt, okay, did not enter the land, he's giving, he's giving the warning about those who l just go to church and do those sorts of things, but haven't really been saved, okay? That, that's where he's going with this, but he's using it as he's showing you that this is a type that pictures the rest that is to come, okay? That, and the reason this is so important is we've walked through all these patterns and types, but then when the real thing comes, we see how the first thing pointed to the second thing. And so rest here for the author of Hebrews is, yes, it pointed back to the land of rest, but really that was pointing to salvation, rest in Jesus. Now, the other major point that the author of Hebrews makes is this, that David was the one who wrote Psalm 95. But David's in the land. In fact, he's reached the pinnacle of rest, hasn't he? Remember we just described that? David fought off all the enemies and he was given rest and his son is going to establish the temple. You're like, yay, we've reached rest. Finally, there's rest. But the author of Hebrews picks up on Psalm 95 and says, David is talking about entering another kind of rest. How could he do that? Well, the author of Hebrews is like, because Jesus is the rest. That's where the ultimate rest is pointing to. And this is how he argues that, okay? He, he, he walks through and, and he says, uh, why is it that David would be pointing to a future rest? That he's already in the land unless there is a rest that is outside of that land. And then he says, David said today, he fixed a day that salvation is offered. And Psalm 95 is, as you walk through it, I have it there for you. It's actually about entering into the presence of the Lord and drawing near to the Lord and being close to the Lord. That's where rest comes from. In fact, that's the entire argument of Psalm 95. Hey, you want real rest? Enter into the presence of the Lord. So the author of Hebrews is screaming, Rest is not found in the Old Testament system of being in the land and keeping institutional rest or the temple. Those things have been blown up when Jesus came. And this is how you have to read Hebrews 3 and 4, those two major points. And you can go back and you can study it. Hopefully you'll understand the two things I'm saying. And that is, one, this this is used as a pattern to point towards spiritual rest. And because David wrote it after he was in the land, you should further know and understand that David was pointing towards a better rest to come, not rest that simply comes from the land. Right, because that's, I mean, that's what the author of Hebrews is doing all the way through, right? Jesus is the better Jesus everything. Jesus is the better. Right, he's the better. So he's the better rest, the true rest. So with that, two straightforward New Testament passages that directly speak towards festivals, Sabbath days, and what we do with them. What do we do with them? Daniel, what does Colossians 2.16 say? Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to festivals or new moon or a Sabbath day. Right? What are all the? What is all that language pointing to in the Old Testament? What are all those things attached to? The institution, right? The institutional rest, part of the Mosaic covenant, right? This this 
this covenant that God made with, with Moses and the people of Israel at Sinai. He says, listen, therefore no one is to act as your judge in those regards of saying, hey, it is not about, we're not gonna look at you to see, are you keeping this institutional rest? Why? Look at verse 17. Because these things are a mere shadow of what is to come because the substance belongs to Jesus. We just see in two verses in Colossians how we are to understand the Old Testament, how we're to understand the Mosaic law. That word shadow, now that you've taken the threads class, what does that word shadow mean? It means it's a type, it's, it's a, a pattern, thread. it's a shadow. Those words go together. That this is a picture of a spiritual reality. <laughs> That's what all of these things continue to point to. And there's an entire thread, typology, pattern of the land of rest. Is there anything wrong with knowing about the festivals or understanding some of the, the richness of the imagery Absolutely in those shadows? Absolutely not. And even participating in them, right? So have any, anyone here ever participated in a Seder meal? Yeah. Was it? Isn't that incredible? Was it? If you don't know, a Seder is, a, is the Passover meal, the, the, the meal that leads up to the Passover celebration, and it's that night. Uh, and so if you've, if you've never, they're, they're incredible. They're, they're rich. There's a lot of, of imagery and symbolism woven in, especially if you get a Messianic Jewish teacher that can walk you through different aspects of it and show you the way it points back to the Exodus, but then it points forward to Christ. Daniel, is there anything wrong with participating in that? No, there's nothing wrong with participating. But let me ask the, the other side of that question. Do we have to, as a follower of Jesus, participate in those things in order to find rest and in Christ, in order to truly be able to understand what he is doing in this grand story of scripture, is that a requirement? No. 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 Right? Is there benefit? I would say it this way. If your reason for, it all gets back to your motivation and your purpose for understanding it. If your purpose to understand it is I want to understand the gospel better. I want to understand the work of Jesus better. And I want to see him in these things then study it till your heart's content, right? But if you study it thinking somehow I've got to learn this so I can practice this in order to earn righteousness before Christ, then stop studying it, right? There's a, there is a fine line there that you must stay on the right side of. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to, to put it straightforward, if you think God is more pleased with you from doing those things, you are usurping the gospel. And if you think if someone does not do those things that God is displeased with them, you are usurping the gospel. Does that make sense? So did the earliest Jewish Christians, did Paul and Peter and, and those, that first church, did they continue to practice some of the festivals, the things that they grew up with? Well, yeah, they even kept the dietary law. Why? Peter's like, because I always have, right? I, I don't eat those things. Old so habits. they continue those patterns. And, th and then you see as you walk through the book of Acts, those patterns get pressed and they get shattered. Um, but it's when you make it law, it's when you think that it makes you right with the Lord. And, and the it's implications here... So we began with, with blue light laws and, and moving. Uh, we don't keep the Saturday. We keep the Sunday. Remember the Sunday and keep it holy. Sit on the couch. Don't go out and play. That pleases the Lord. Oh, yeah. And, and, and we, people went crazy with it. Like, I can remember this, and it was so, like, forming for me as a child, like, my my parents would look out the window at people mowing their yards that I knew had been at church that day and were following the Lord. And they were like, 
They're, they're, they're rebelling against God because they're mowing their yard on a Sunday. They're not keeping the Sabbath, right? I mean, <laughs> are, we missing, <laughs> are we missing the point of rest, the point of the Sabbath when, you know, because that, that is where you can, those are some of the paths that you can end up going down yeah. when you don't understand what, what that thread is teaching, right? When you pull it out and you isolate it and you say God is interested in a day of the week, right? And what you do on that day and somehow that makes you more holy or righteous if you do these things on that day, right? You can pull that out and try to just look at that totally, you know, void of any other scripture, right? And you can end up down some really crazy, you know, rabbit holes with it if you don't see it in its context, of, of the narrative of this, this thread of the shadow that this day, this Sabbath day is what it's really pointing to. Yeah, so what we would say is the institutional rest that you find in the Mosaic law is underneath the Mosaic covenant and it finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And rest in the New Testament looks different. It is found in a person and in that personal relationship. And that category has changed. Now, is there anything wrong with taking a day of rest and recuperating and understanding your daily rhythms and weekly rhythms or any of those things? No, of, of course not. It's when it becomes law. Okay, we wanted to hammer that and, and be straightforward with it. We know it's a routine question. We know it comes up often. Um, and you may have wrestled with that. So seeing that through this changes everything. Now, we haven't finished because the Bible ends in a magnificent place, right? So if, if we are kicked out of Eden, that place of rest that we long for, okay, and it didn't come through the Mosaic law and the promised land of rest. Instead, it came through a person the Bible finishes with the new heaven and the new earth, right? And listen to the language that we've compiled here. Look at how Revelation 14 calls both hell a place of no rest. See that? They will have no rest day and night. But heaven, they will rest from their labors. Look at the picture of Isaiah chapter 11 Okay, we read a piece of this before, but Isaiah 11, even though it's way back 700 years before Christ and it's in the Old Testament, it's a picture of when, look at, look at verse 10, when, when that root of Jesse, his resting place will be glorious. But then as you read through, the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. You get this picture of rest. Everything, like the curse has been undone. The land and, and all of creation will return to rest. That's, that's what that whole picture is. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we get the story. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith where Abraham comes and he leaves the land of, of his upbringing and he goes and he, he travels through this land this, that's going to be promised to his descendants. But look at the way that it describes him. It describes him as an alien, a stranger, exile. But it says exile on the earth. Actually, Hebrews 11 presses us and says, you know, even though Abraham left his, his, home, uh, his home city and he came and he wandered as an exile in this land, he wasn't really looking for this land, was he? No, he was looking for a heavenly city, yeah. a heavenly country, one that's built and whose architect is, is God. Amen. Okay? He's looking for a heavenly one. And now, Daniel, take it on home. Revelation 21. So when we get to Revelation 21, right, we're coming to where we're bringing all of the threads we've looked at together, right, under this, this big picture of 
of rest. So I'm going to read these five verses. And as we do, I want you to see, as we do, what other threads pop out at you that we've looked at that are all attached to rest. Okay, so listen to these verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, hint, hint, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they will be his people and God himself will be among them and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no longer any death there will be no longer will there be any mourning or crying or pain the first things have passed away and he who sits on the throne said behold I am making all things new Now, when you think about this, yeah, praise God, right? When we read this, it's like, hallelujah. Why do we, why do, why does, why do those emotions come up in us when we read the close of Revelation? It's because God built into us this longing for rest that is only found in him. And when we get to this point, we can take that breath that says, that day is coming, (laughs) when I will find that rest for my soul that I have been longing for, right? And we we see it here, right? This picture of the bride, right? When the marriage, you know, us, the bride of Christ to our bridegroom, when that marriage happens, what will we have in that moment? Rest, right? When, When King Jesus sits on the throne, what will we have? We will have rest, right? When, when we are in the tabernacle, who was allowed to serve in the tabernacle? The priest, right? What does scripture say about us? We're a kingdom of priests, right? When we are in that tabernacle, that dwelling place of God, what do we know? We have We have rest. You see a pattern forming here, right? And then it says, and he will dwell among them, right? When we read that, remember when we talked about this, this imagery and this pattern, this thread of the tabernacle and the temple, right? We said the word became flesh and dwelt, or what's that other word that we, that that word means? Tabernacled, right? The word, yeah, that's used there. Tabernacled among us. What does it say about the Lord in this new holy city of Jerusalem? In verse three, he will dwell among them. What do we know to be true in Eden? When they were in this land, where did God dwell? He walked with them in Eden, right? So when we're with him, when he tabernacles with us, we have, we have rest. And then the glorious blessing of that rest is what we see here. Right, that he will wipe away every tear. There won't be any death or mourning or crying or pain. All the former things will pass away and all things will be made new. And if we went back to the Isaiah passage that Pastor Jason talked about a minute ago, if you look at verse nine, we see another one of our threads where we see that the earth in verse nine will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. What did God tell Adam and Eve in Genesis that they were to do? They were to... Fill the earth and subdue it as his image bearers. But instead of doing that, they filled the earth with the image of who? Not God, but themselves, right? Yeah, their own sinful selves. But now look in this place of rest, it will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. You see how they all come together? Right, to this culmination of in Jesus the person who says, come to me and I will give you rest, right? It's all pointing there. It's all building to there. That is where our hope is, 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 is fixed, is on the person of Jesus because it is only in the person of Jesus will our souls find the rest that we crave as his image bearers, amen? Amen. So, so what blows me away is the last two chapters of the Bible and, and these first five verses of chapter 21. What do you see? You see 
rest converge, you see temple converge, you see king converge, you see marriage and bride converge, you see uh, dominion and, and dynasty, you see all the threads that we've walked through, through this entire, you see them all converged there. And you walk through this entire book, and Daniel and I were, were just laughing our heads off because it's, it's almost like there was an author that planned this entire book. It's, it's almost like it all comes together like it's supposed to and resolves at the end. Hmm. But it was written over thousands of years and real time and space and history. Who could do that? Who could weave prophecy that's told in pattern typology, shadows and patterns and types and find their ultimate fulfillment in the coming sun? Who could do all of this? Who could, who could establish a real group of people going in slavery and coming out and all that took place in the wilderness and entering it and all that took place by going, uh, being exiled again in Assyria and coming back and weaving all of this and having prophet after prophet come and say, you know what we really need is a new exodus. You know what we really need is a new covenant. You know what we really need is a new King David. You know what we really need is King Jesus. And then when he comes to see the way that all of these threads converge and find their ultimate fulfillment in him, in salvation, in a spiritual kingdom that no one ever saw coming, that he was the righteous sufferer, and no one knew how to piece these things together. But once they do get pieced together and you can see it, you're like, my God, my Lord and my God, there is no one but you who could possibly have written all of history and woven and given prophets these little bits and pieces that you need to do this in a particular way, right? How, how could Daniel, 500 years before Christ, endure such events and Darius roll a stone over the mouth of the lion's den and seal it and then come back that next morning hoping he's still, how could any of that stuff happen? Unless there is a God who is just screaming, this is my son. I'm writing all of history. I've come to save you from your sin and to reveal to you who I am, to call you to myself, make a people unto myself, and my glory will go. Unless he is sovereign and orchestrating the whole thing. And I love, I love the, the phrase, it's finished. It's secure. Every time we think we're getting to a place of rest in scripture, it always gets messed up. It always falls apart. It always falls apart. But in verse five of Revelation 21, it says, and he who sits on the throne, he is seated. Why is he seated? Because the work is done. It's done. It is finished. Right? Verse one, I, I saw this and I had never thought about this before, if I'm just being honest. Verse one, where he says in this picture, the new heaven and the new earth and the first was gone. It says, and there was no longer any sea. I started thinking about back to all the threads where we have seen the sea, right? The, the Red Sea, right? This, this place where, where, where there was this death, right? It was this barrier, right? That was parted for them to cross, but then it closed up and there was this Jordan River and it was this barrier from getting into the land and it had to be parted, right? There always this picture with the water. That's why we baptize, right? It's this picture of death that's occurred, but what is no longer separating us from the presence of Christ? It says there's no longer in EC because it's done. And that's our hope. That's our future. This land, right? This better country, this heavenly one that we all long for, just like Abraham, right? We, as the true children of Abraham, right? Those who have placed our faith in Jesus, we long for this home. But it's not a longing that is based in, well, wish, right? Or, you know, something that is unsure, something that is a moving target. No, it is fixed. Yeah. Amen? It's fixed. Yeah, if, if there's one thing we would want you to take out of this, right? We, we want you to be able to read your Bibles. We want you to see this movement of Scripture. But at the end of the day, 
is that you would have such a hope, such a confidence that your God is on the throne and that he has saved you and he will continue to reign until the end. And I know whom I have believed and I'm confident that he is able to keep me until that day. Amen. Will you pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, we love you, we worship you. Your word is so good. You are magnificent. Amen. Who is man that you are mindful of him and that you would save us, that you would call us, that you would place your spirit inside of us, that you would move through all of history and eternity to make your name great by calling us your own. And then pouring upon grace upon grace, not only through the duration of our lives, but on into eternity. We worship you. Help us to understand you more and to walk with you and to spend every one of our days for your glory, for you are worthy of all of our praise. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you back next week.